have your Bible this morning, uh, and I hope you do, I, I want to invite you to find the book of Daniel, which is a, a little past halfway in your Bible if you have a paper Bible. Uh, and this morning, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 1. And today is actually the second week uh, in uh, our study on the book of, of Daniel. Last week, Pastor Corey spoke a fantastic message, uh, but he started this series on the study uh, of Daniel with Daniel chapter 10, uh, because we wanted to speak the, the, the chapter uh, where we have the Daniel fast come in. And so we started our study with chapter 10, uh, but this morning we are uh, starting all over again here with, uh, with chapter number 1. And, uh, and, and this book is thought to have been written by Daniel himself, written later on in his life, and he kind of is telling a lot of the stories and accounts of things that happened throughout his life. And the purpose of his writing is really to bring hope, uh, to bring us hope and to bring his readers hope, hope in a God who is in control, hope in a God who shows up in incredible ways at just the right time, uh, and to really, Daniel wants to motivate his readers to honor God in every area of their life and in every season of their life, no matter if you feel like your life is falling apart, no matter if someone is even threatening your life. Uh, Daniel here wants us to wa wants us to, to to submit our lives to God and to honor God with everything that we are. And I love the book of Daniel. It is one of my favorite books in the entire Bible, uh, filled with incredible supernatural stories and things that happen. And in fact, right away in chapter number one, we're going to see something here, and I just can't wait to show you this. Uh, so let's get into this today. I want to ask you to stand with me all over this place. And let's start reading uh, from Daniel chapter 1. We're going to start in verse number 1. And let me remind you of something. Uh, the way in which you posture yourself, the way in which we posture ourselves in a situation like this has everything to do with the Word of God uh, moving and doing things in us. And so let's lean in today. Let's sit on the edge of our seats and, and expect God to do something. And, and I believe you will not be uh, disappointed. So Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, here's what it says. In the third, reign, third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Je Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. Uh, these he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Verse 3, then the king ordered Azpanez, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them to a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Let's pray. God, we, we open ourselves up to you. We ask that you would move. We ask that you would challenge us, that you would speak through your very word. God, come and do something so, so powerful and so real. We give this to you, God, and we thank you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen, amen. All right, give somebody a high five and have a seat. Well, it's great to be back this week. Uh, if you didn't know, last Sunday, I traveled four hours pretty much straight up north to uh, a little town called Big Fork, Minnesota. Uh, there, there's it's a town of like 400 people, and I went up there and had the opportunity to, to speak at a little church of about 25 or 30, and... Uh, just to get to encourage them and, and spend some time with them and their pastor. And it was such a cool thing. Uh, what we have going on here in this church is something pretty special. 
And uh, we also believe, like Pastor Corey just referenced, that the kingdom of God is so much bigger than us right here. And so this is just something that's so near and dear to my heart to figure out how to help uh, other people and other pastors specifically. So it was so cool to be there. Uh, I missed you guys. I love our church. And I, every time we're gone, I'm like, I want to be there. Uh, but it's just such a cool thing. And, uh, and you're in good hands uh, here with Pastor Corey and the other guys, aren't you? They're so good. And uh, so someone laughed when I said that. But, and a couple of people clapped. So we'll just go with it. All right. <clears throat> well, uh, I've been reading a lot lately. And, and one of the books that I've been reading is about a missionary uh, named Eric Little. Uh, you, you might have heard of him. The first half of his story is actually featured in uh, a movie called Chariots of Fire, which is from the, early, uh, from the early 80s. Raise your hand if you're old and have seen that movie like I have. Okay, wow, that's good. Uh, this week I was telling Pastor Micah about Chariots of Fire, and he, he replied, he said, is that the movie about Ben-Hur? And I said, I said, well, no. Uh, Ben-Hur was a movie in the 50s, and it's not even a true story, and it actually takes place in like 26 AD. Uh, Chariots of Fire is the 20th, 20th century, and it's actually about a missionary to China. Uh, and, and actually, over the next couple weeks, I want to share some parts of this missionary story, as Eric Little, uh, one kind of piece at a time, uh, kind of side by side with the story of Daniel, because there's just kind of some things that, that go and line up with that. Uh, but Eric Little was born in Scotland, but he spent the majority of his life in China as a missionary. Now, eventually, he will die at the age of 42 in a Japanese internment cap, camp um, just five months before this camp is liberated. Uh, and, uh, but, but, but being a missionary wasn't what made Eric Little famous. Uh, uh, and this is where some of you may remember this. Eric Little is famous for what happened in the 1924 Olympics, uh, which took place in Paris. He was nicknamed the Flying Scotsman, uh, which is what people called him. He was a sprinter, and he was favored to win the gold medal that year in the World Olympics. Uh, he was the Usain Bolt of 1924, like seriously the fastest man on the planet at that time. But even more than a sprinter, Eric Little was a Christian, and he was very outspoken about running to honor God in fact, honoring God was, like, it was central to his life and central to his belief system. And the way that he lived showed that in so many ways. That belief eventually would lead him to drop out of the gold medal 100-meter sprint in the Olympics. He drops out. Why? Because the qualifying race for the 100-meter sprint took place on a Sunday. And for Eric Little, Sunday was God's day. It was a day of rest and a day to worship. Now, so he drops out of the race. And to say that this was an unpopular decision was an absolute understatement. Uh, his teammates were against him. His friends were against him. The entire United Kingdom, who he was running for, were against him. All sorts of people trying and attempting to get him to change his mind. They begin to say things to him like, God wants you to run in this race. And they'd say things like, can you imagine the influence you will have for God if you win the gold on a, on a, on a world scale here? But he simply would not budge. In his words, he said this, he said, God made me fast. And I run to bring honor and glory to him, and I do not run on the Lord's day. His convictions ran so deep and his love for God so strong that, like, seriously, the gold medal favorite in the 100-meter dash uh, drops out, withdraws from the race. That's crazy. Daniel chapter 1 is going to show us, uh, in, in a way, a similar situation. And, and Daniel is immediately going to take center stage here in this story uh, in making a decision that at first can seem almost silly, uh, but it's all in the name of, of honoring and glorifying God with my life. Now, now, before we get there, before we really jump into Daniel chapter 1, we need to add a little history to the mix here. Because in this situation specifically, history adds so much to this story as we understand what is taking place all around uh, in this way. Okay, uh, History tells us that in 605 B.C., Okay, long time ago, 605 B.C., Babylon invaded Israel. 
This is a historic fact, even outside of the Bible. And when Babylon came in and took over Israel, it was not pretty. In fact, it was a bloody and brutal mess. Thousands and thousands of people died. Like, like thousands died. Uh, some were left to kind of scavenge the ruins of Jerusalem. And, and a few others were even brought back to Babylon to become slaves for the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, who was, the, who was basically the most powerful man in the world at that time. So as we're reading the beginning of the book of Babylon, this is what has just happened. Okay? Babylon has invaded Israel. People are dead all over the place. And now we are, we are looking at life in Babylon from the perspective of someone who just went through that. So read with me starting in verse number 3 here. And let's piece some of this together. It says, The king ordered Aspenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. These are some uh, of the Israelites who had just been invaded and now brought back to Babylon to be, to be slaves. Go bring some of them into the king's service, is what the king says. Young man without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. Okay, let's figure this out here. The king asked one of his officials to search through this pool of captives uh, to find the best of the best is what we have. Uh, those from royal families, those who are the best looking, those who are physically the strongest, those who are the smartest, find the best of the best and bring them to serve in the king's palace. We don't know exactly how many Israelites were brought in in this situation, but we know it was a fairly significant number here. So, so let's go on, verse 5. It says, The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. He provides the food for these people in their training. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Take the best of the best train them for three years so they know the language, they know the customs, they know the culture, they, they are the, oh, giving them new names, all of this type of stuff, and then after three years, the king is going to interview from that pool and decide who is the best of the best of the best, and they're going to come serve me in the palace. Uh, and verse number six gives us a few names. If you're from a church background, you, you may recognize some of these names, like pretty famous Sunday school characters is what we have here. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Michelle, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. We have Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego right here in, as a part of these. We have an introduction to those four men right there. And over the next few weeks, uh, we're going to primarily focus on Daniel. As we take this chapter by chapter... Uh, though we will hang out with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego at one point because they have a pretty great story uh, as well. But as we begin this study on Daniel, I want to remind you and, and I, I want to paint a picture, I guess, of what has just happened in his life in a pretty horrific way, okay? Uh, uh, and, and, and so picture this with me, that Daniel is living in Jerusalem and things are fantastic, he is, he is of some sort of a noble rank in some way there. We don't know exactly what that looks like, but we can piece some of this together. Uh, he's living there, and out of the blue, this military power, the most powerful military on the planet, shows up and starts slaughtering people. Left and right. Your friends. Your family members. People you went to school with, people you work with, many of them are now dead and have been murdered in a horrific way, a horrible way. But there's no time to mourn because here's what they did to Daniel and here's what they did to many others as well. Daniel is forced to march from his home in Jerusalem across two entire deserts, okay, Jerusalem to Babylon, look it up, 500 miles as the crow flies, if you take the road, they, they say that is almost double. We're looking at 500 to 1,000 miles that they march these people, they march them across the desert. He's walked 
500 miles from his home to a foreign land where they give him a new haircut, a new wardrobe, they change his name, and they begin to teach him a new language that he has never learned. That the beginning of the book of Daniel simply does not tell of the horror that Daniel has just faced in history. And we know this to be true. Daniel is in the middle of a horrible situation, horrible circumstances, completely overwhelmed in every single way. He's mourning the loss of his loved ones. I mean, l- let me just say this. If you are overwhelmed right now in your life for whatever the reason and whatever that means to you, th- this series and this study on, on this man named Daniel can bring hope to your situation because we are about to see... Uh, God show himself so faithful and show himself so true in the midst of some of the most horrendous situations you can ever imagine. And from all of this and from all of these uh, young Jewish men that have been marched, Daniel was chosen to be a part of this group that is brought to the palace of the king. They begin to put him and others as well through this three years of training. But now let's, let's look at verse number eight because Daniel is going to refuse to do something. And this is going to lead to, in my opinion, why Daniel is in the Bible. All starts right here. All right? Verse number 8 says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now, when we first read this story, this can be a little bit confusing to us. Because Daniel's in a strange land. Family and friends have just been killed. And somebody wants to give him a steak. And a glass of wine, and he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. And I'm kind of scratching my head here, like, Daniel, eat the food. I mean, come on now. This is the king's food right here. Everything that's good, eat eat the food, man. It's kind of like Eric Little choosing not to run in the Olympics on Sunday. Uh, for, For so many of us, it's like, just run the race. I mean, for real, think about this, buddy. What are you doing? I mean, that's the way that this can look. And, and feel on the surface. But here's what's going on. And uh, two pieces to this puzzle of why Daniel takes a stand against eating this royal food. Okay? The first is this. That much of the food served by the Babylonians and at the king's table would have been what is called unclean. Uh, and, and, and against the Jewish law. Either because the specific food w- was for be- forbidden. Kind of like... E- eating pig of any kind for the Jewish people is unclean. It's not okay. Or maybe it's because it was not prepared right. Specific Jewish laws talk about draining the blood in certain ways when you're butchering animals and all of that type of stuff. Uh, clear guidelines in this. And, and to eat such foods that have not been prepared right, or this, like it would have been considered sin to the Jewish people, to these Israelites. It would have caused them to be unclean before God. But there's another piece to this as well of why he refuses this. Because in Babylon, much of this food had been directly offered as sacrifices to Babylonian gods. Uh, Babylon worshipped many gods, not the true god. Uh, They worshipped all sorts of fake gods all over the place, and they would take food and wine, and they would serve them to their gods. And of course, the gods would not eat them. The gods aren't real. And they wouldn't eat them, and they would take this food, and they would bring it into the palace, and they would serve it to the king and, and all the people there. And, and by eating this food and by drinking this wine, it is, it is in a way indirectly saying, I am a worshiper of the gods of Babylon. And Daniel just draws the line right there. I mean, he says, you can kill my family, you can march me across the desert, you can make me a slave, you can change my name, but I will not acknowledge another God. I won't do it. And he says, I'm not going to eat the food. Let's see what happens next. Verse 9. It says, now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The the king would have my head because of you. Daniel, if you don't eat this food and and you start looking all straggly and, and, and unhealthy, the king is going to kill me. Verse 11. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it says, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat, 
and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance to what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. Okay, behind the king's back, the king's servant here puts his neck out on the line. He agrees to this test to let them not eat the king's food that has been given to them, but to just eat vegetables and to drink water for 10 days. Daniel here is doing a mini Daniel fast, isn't he? Yeah, come on. All right. Ten days, nothing but vegetables and water. Uh, and in fact, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, people who don't eat bacon on average actually live close to ten years longer. Isn't that crazy? Yes, I know. It, it's not. Some of you are like, yeah, ten horrible, <laughs> awful, <laughs> baconless years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I get it. I get it. <laughs> All right. But ten days, ten days, nothing but vegetables and water. That's actually not true, by the way. I made that up just for the joke effect, okay? Yeah. You're like, oh, I'm going to stop eating bacon. <laughs> Verse 15. Let's see what happens next. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Now, this is the beginning of a God thing here. A supernatural thing, the favor of God shown on these four young men in a powerful way, and it's going to continue chapter after chapter. In fact, look at this, verse 17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds, which is going to come up in the chapters ahead. Uh, at the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar, the king. Okay, the three years of training is up. They ate nothing but vegetables and water for three years. Come on, somebody. Here we go. They're not eating the royal food. They're learning a new language, learning the customs, learning the ways to do things and how to serve right. And then they are presented to the king after three years of all of that. And they go in for this interview with the king of Babylon the most powerful man on the planet during this time. And they stand before him, and let, let's, let's see what happens. I love this. Verse 19. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. None equal to those three. And so they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Daniel and his three friends, Israelites, who have come out of the worst situation that you could ever imagine, they show up and Daniel takes a stand and says, I will not honor another God. I'm going to do this. I'm not going to eat the food. And what we see is the favor and the supernatural power Miraculous things show up in his life in such a massive and huge way. It's, it's absolutely incredible. But here's the deal. Like, like what's fascinating about Daniel and this story is God did not go to Daniel and say, Hey, buddy, you're going to have a bad day. Some things are going to happen and you're not going to like it. But listen, Daniel, when, you get, when they give you the food and the wine, don't drink it. And don't eat it. And if you don't, and you listen to me, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do this, and this, and this, and one day, eventually, there's going to be a book of the Bible named after you, and people are going to name their kids after you. Do that, Daniel. We don't have that in the story. That's not what this is. Daniel didn't know any of that. We're talking about a regular guy who was living through a season of pain, a season of difficulty. He's watched his loved ones die. They've been taken away from him. He's been ripped away from his homeland. He's been forced into slavery. But listen to this. Write this down. Daniel was determined to honor and glorify God with his life. He was determined. It was his motivation. It was his desire. It was what he thought about. It's what he talked about, what he prayed about. How do I know that? We're going to see this surface again and again. 
And unfortunately for so many of us and so many like American Christians, this idea of honoring and glorifying God with our entire lives, it's just sort of taken uh, backstage. Like, like the, there are some areas that are easier than others, but, but when it comes to the way that we think and it comes to the motivation of why we live and the way that we live our lives, it's just not, it's just not there. But you can read in history about so many, Eric Little being one, that this was their driving force to glorify God, to honor God with everything they did, no matter the cost. Like to the point where the, the, the gold medal Olympic favorite makes the decision to drop out of the race. Because for him, in comparison to honoring God with his life, th- th- this was a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. And I believe that Eric Little would not have gone down in history. And his story would not have been told in a major motion picture if he had simply ran and won. How many gold medal sprinters can you name? Usain Bolt? Eric Little? That's where it stopped for me. Like... He didn't even win the gold medal for that, actually, so he doesn't even count. I I can't name any except for the one who's been winning the last decade, okay? And you get it. And And I believe that we would not be reading the story of Daniel in the Bible if he had just eaten the food and not experienced the supernatural favor in God in the midst of his situation. And I think, I think the Word of God today is asking us, like, a very pointed question. The, the question for me is, like, are we determined to honor and glorify God with our lives? Are we determined to do that? And I, and I love the word determined here. Determined is defined in this way, having made a firm decision and being resolved not to change it. Does that describe the way that you are living your life? With honoring God being center stage in every decision that you make and everything you do. From what movies you watch, am I honoring God with my life? For how you handle your personal finances and your money and the way that you spend and what you do, am I honoring God with my life? To where you spend your time, to how you treat the people around you, am I honoring God with my life? Am I determined to do that at every cost, whatever that means? Whatever it means, committed to and determined to honor in God with our lives. Music team, will you please come? See, I believe, I believe that God wants to pour out like supernatural favor, supernatural blessing, supernatural miraculous things in his people like we read about in all throughout the Bible. And the book of Daniel is a, is a massive, awesome example of that. But listen, like before we go, I want to show you one last verse. Th- this is from an Old Testament book called Second Chronicles. And I love the way the message translation writes this. It says this, God, God is always on the alert, constantly on the lookout for people who are totally committed to him. Like, like God is looking For those who are totally committed to him. Everything they do, everything they are, all the time, every day, totally committed to him. God God is looking for Daniels. The decisions he made, it's crazy, it could cost him his life. He's looking for Eric Littles, who stands up against an entire nation, who's saying, Eric, you you are dumb. Why are you doing this? Your whole country hates that you're doing this. You are making the wrong choice. And he stands up to doing whatever it takes to bring honor to God. Like, let, let's be people who don't eat the food. Let, let's be people who don't run the race. Let's be people who honor God with everything we have and everything we are. Now, something I learned a long time ago and I haven't explained this and said this enough, is there's a difference, I guess, between what's called condemnation and conviction, okay? Uh, Both of them kind of have this feeling of 
inside of like something's not right. Satan, the enemy, brings condemnation, which basically tells you you're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. I can't believe you did that. Uh, you shouldn't be doing that. All this negative, and, and it makes you feel in that way. Conviction is from God. Conviction is, let's get better, and let's move forward. And let's, okay, you may have made a, a, a mess of things in the past, but let's change. And sometimes we get those mixed up, and we feel all junky because the devil puts junk in our head, and the Holy Spirit and God is speaking for some of us today, okay, very specifically, God is, is putting things in your mind right now, and he's saying, you need to move forward. You need to get this out of your life. You need to stop, and you need to, you need to move towards God here a little. And I want to challenge you, like, don't walk out these doors and just continue to do things the same way. And some of us, we... You know, some of us go through horrendous events in our life and really, and we, and we cry out to God and we say, God, do something. And, 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 and I, just, I just feel like if we would do a better job of honoring God with our lives, we would see him show up in huge, miraculous ways like never before. Not that God doesn't hear your prayer, but throughout the scripture, we just see people who, who stepped out and put themselves in a place like this, just experience the favor of God in their life like, like never before. It's absolutely incredible. Daniel's incredible. I'm, I'm so fired up to tell you the rest of his story. So with no one looking around for just a moment, who here would just say, God is speaking to me today to do something different? Whatever that may look like, whatever that may be, if that's you, just quickly show me your hand. Thank you, thank you. Hands all over the place. You have specific things in your mind right now that I believe the Holy Spirit's putting there. God, I pray for every person here today who is, who is lifting their hands saying, that's me. God, I pray that you, that you would do what only you can do. God, that as, as we take a step towards you, God, that you would move towards us just like the Bible says. But God, help us to do what we need to do. Help us to put the right people around us. Help us to, to begin to listen to the right voices. Help us to prioritize the things that matter in our life and all of these things. And as we do that, Lord, I pray that your supernatural favor would show up in ways that only can be explained by you. God, we thank you for that. We worship you. One last thing before we go. We always want to give people an opportunity to respond to Jesus even for the very first time. The Bible says you are a sinner, that I'm a sinner, we are all sinners, and that our sin separates us from God. It's why he sent Jesus to die for you and to die for me, to take our place, to live the life we couldn't live, perfect, and to die the death that we deserve because of our rebellion to God. And the Bible says that if you will put your trust in Jesus and what he did, there is grace, there is love, there is mercy that can be only be found in Jesus. If we do that, if we give him our lives, you will be saved, is what the scripture says. And maybe you're here today and you would say, I have never done that. I've never responded to Jesus and his message, and I want to do that today. If that's you, just quickly show me your hand. Quickly show me your hand. most important decision you will ever make is what you do and how you respond to Jesus and what he's done for you. Anyone at all. God, I pray that as we walk out these doors today that we would experience you and your presence like never before. I pray that you would challenge us and change us and move us forward, God. We want to live our lives honoring and glorifying you with everything we say, everything we do. Help us, God, do that. In your name we pray. And everybody said amen, amen. amen.